We're about ready to take a tour. This is uh, President Kennedy's plane. Johnson used this 1961 through 1965. The Museum, there are no restrictions on, uh, yes. on filming. That's a pleasant surprise. Come on in, turn to the right. Thank you. I caught it on film. Yeah. We're in your way, just some holler. No, it's okay. Oh, the seats wore off. Did you get the presidential seat? Yes, I did. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, so I'm in your way, just... No, no, you're cool. Give me a yell. You're cool. Well, my name's Scott, and I'll be your guide this afternoon. Is it afternoon? Yeah, it's yep. afternoon. Yep. Before we begin, let's find out where everyone's from, starting from the rear. Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah. Huh? San Francisco. Fort Washington, Wisconsin. You know where that is? I know where Port Washington, New York is, but I don't That's know if it's just north, north of Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Oh, all right. That's something that has escaped me. Yeah. <laughs> you too? Milwaukee. Yeah. Milwaukee? All right. Um, I lived in San Francisco for a year. Almost everybody did for a year. <laughs> I lived uh, on Potrero Hill near oh, the yeah. Army Street. Oh, what yeah. was then the Army Street exit of the sure. Bayshore Freeway. Yeah. It's long since been closed. Though. Well, before we begin the actual tour, let me give you a little background on the aeroplane because it's an aeroplane of considerable historical significance inasmuch as it served as a presidential aeroplane for four years, 1961 to 1965. It was the last piston-powered aeroplane in presidential service, and it served at the same time as the first jet-powered aeroplane, oh, a Boeing 707. And the reason that this piston-powered Douglas and the jet-powered Boeing were both in presidential service at the same time is because the time was the Kennedy election of 1960, when jets were new and airports were old, and the new jets required two-mile-long runways, and the old airports offered only one-mile-long oh, runways. And so when Kennedy said to the Air Force, where can I take my nice new Boeing 707 to? Yeah. They replied, why, Mr. President, from any sack base <laughs> to any other sack base. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're upgrading runways? Yes, uh, it was just about that time yeah. that, the, that the National um, Runway Extension Program began, and it finished in the middle 1960s. Mm -hmm. So in 1965, this aeroplane was retired from uh, presidential service because by that time all the major airports had uh, uh, lengthened runways. Well, um, it was December of 1960, the month after Kennedy was elected, that the Air Force fitted this airplane with the interior you are looking at right now and made it ready to deliver to Jack Kennedy on Inauguration Day in January of 61. Folks, that's a little over 30 years now, mm -hmm. and uh, this interior has not been changed in all that time. So it's looking a little threadbare. Some even say well-worn. Yeah. But as a museum, our function is to preserve history as best we can. So rather than reupholster sure. everything to try to make it look spiffy, we simply go around with a pair of shears every month, snip off all the little Irish pennants, <laughs> spray the upholstery with Scotch Guard, rub a little armor all into the leather chair, and hope for the best. Yeah. So far, so good. So our two presidents have sat in this chair. Huh? Kennedy and Johnson no, are the kidding. two, yeah. Uh, this chair, in fact, has a kind of interesting history. Johnson used it, but it was really designed uh, for Jack Kennedy, and it was designed by Jack Kennedy's back doctor. Interesting. Uh, yeah, he was uncomfortable sitting down, and so what she did was go out and hire a furniture manufacturer and then worked with the manufacturer to build this chair. It's one of the few custom-built chairs, or I should say expensive chairs, 
whose back does not change uh, angles. She wanted it in one angle only. And then what she did was copy the contours of Kennedy's sure. back and, and, and duplicate them in the back of that chair and fill those contours with very firm padding that projected way out. Nobody could miss it back then. So he must look forward to sitting in this chair. Yes, as a matter of fact, he reported that it was the only chair he could sit in for longer than an hour without his back hurting. Unbelievable. Yeah, so she did something right. Mm. Well, while sitting there, he had access to several things. There was an oxygen bottle here. Um, while this is a, pre a, a pressurized airplane, it was built before central, pressure, uh, central oxygen systems uh, were installed. And so uh, there were individual oxygen bottles scattered throughout the airplane, and they were all put in those wooden cabinets with the lid on it. And each one had four masks connected to it. This is the one that was by the president. Next to that is the white telephone that was connected by radio link to the switchboard operator in the White House, who would then get anyone on the phone that he wanted, or uh, give him uh, the ability to dial it if he wanted to do that himself. Next to that was a shortwave radio that Kennedy had installed because he was an avid shortwave listener. Hmm, interesting. Uh, yeah, and uh, very much enjoyed the idea of listening to foreign stations using an antenna miles in the sky instead of just a rooftop antenna like the one he had installed on the White House. And then next to that is a black telephone that was an intra-aeroplane phone uh, which would connect him to anybody or any compartment uh, in the airplane, and he chose his compartment via those little red buttons. Hmm. Um, when jo they, they are all labeled, though the labeling has uh, gotten very, Since very dim over right. the years. But if you look closely, you can still see the labeling. Uh, Johnson abused the privilege, as he abused almost every privilege. <laughs> uh, his uh, nature was, a, was to be a hyperactive personality, yes. and he could not sit still and not bug somebody. <laughs> and on his very first trip, uh, he called the cockpit about every 10 to 15 minutes and said things like, how high are we? How fast are we going? What's the temperature? <laughs> and after just the first trip, the pilots got so fed up with it that they went out to a street fair and they found these Mickey Mouse instruments, something like the Tank of Verde Swap Shop that we have here. They found these Mickey Mouse instruments, installed them themselves, connected them to the sensors on the airplane, and then said to Johnson, that these instruments are twice as big as the ones in the cockpit and therefore they're twice as reliable and we put them here especially for you Mr. President. Johnson bought it and stopped uh, Kind of in your face, you know. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, he didn't catch on uh, uh, uh. that it was an attempt to keep him out of the cockpit. He was just that much of a pain in the neck. The white phone would be the secure phone that... Uh, the white phone passed through a, um, uh, a scrambler which the radio operator could turn on or off as he wished. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever he wanted to make uh, secure communications, he had that capability. Interesting. There were times when he didn't, though. He sure. might just call the White House and ask to be plugged in to talk to Jackie. Uh -huh. Speaking of Jackie, she made the longest trip on this airplane that anybody ever made on it. She did it by herself without the president coming along. <laughs> she visited, uh, she made an official state visit to the government of India and she had to take this airplane instead of the jet for the same old reason uh, the jet could not fit into the 5,000 foot long strip at the Delhi airport. And only this wow, airplane could. So she spent 25 hours in the air oh, instead wow. of 13. Did they complain about Sununu? Um, Sununu, I think, is in trouble. Did anybody yeah, see the cartoon? Uh, it had a picture of uh, a hangar that was labeled Andrews Air Force Base, yeah, and a guy's that. answering the phone in there, and he's answering Sununu Airlines. <laughs> uh, I noticed the, uh, this yeah. would be the sleeping quarters also? Yeah. Well, it could be. Yeah. It didn't have to be. It yeah. could be. There are five regular berths on the airplane, but there are also four uh, couches that could be used as mm -hmm. a sleeping thing. And yeah, those would have been curtains in case somebody did want to take a nap on the couch. Very few naps were taken because most presidential trips began at mid-morning and got to where they were going mid-afternoon because that way he got the best press coverage. It made uh, <laughs> uh, the afternoon editions of the sure, newspaper, and sure. it made TV news that night. 30 second news bites. Yeah. They were pretty much born in the Kennedy era. Kennedy is the one who has to be credited for winning the first presidential campaign via television. Sure, oh yes. He, he, made, uh, he made the rules that are still understood because Nixon didn't abide by them and lost, even though he was the favorite going in. Sure. 
Well, as we go forward, folks, the compartments get smaller and smaller. So we're going to have to get friendlier and friendlier. <laughs> That's a bathroom back there. Yeah. Okay, why are we not focusing? Jack Kennedy not only understood the value of an airplane in day-in, day-out presidential service, he also understood that you needed a sympathetic press corps to fully utilize the airplane. Mm -hmm. And so he had the Air Force install this compartment, which he dedicated to the use of the reporters whom he would personally invite. Naturally, the reporters loved being invited to ride along with the president. But they did insist that they be given some sort of communications equipment to um, get their stories back into their home newspapers. And it was this equipment that was installed for their use. Mm. Now, that equipment looks to me like it came out of the 1930s, yeah, sure. even though this era was the, was the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. So I have to presume that the Air Force officer detailed to satisfying the reporter's requests was not uh, kindly affectioned unto the press corps. Nonetheless, this equipment uh, was put into first class operating order by the uh, technicians and the mechanics who were assigned to this airplane. After all, they were the best in the, air, in the Air Force because it was a presidential airplane. And so the reporters had no trouble using that old fashioned equipment. Mm -hmm. Well, Jack Kennedy made sure that the reporters were never charged for using government uh, communications equipment, never charged to fly around on Air Force One, not even charged to eat presidential lunch. And as a result of that, no reporter ever filed a story critical of the president. <laughs> Jack Kennedy was no one's fool. <laughs> Ten years after he died, the Congress caught on as to what was going on on Air Force One passed a new law that said, from that moment forward, any reporter who is to ride around on Air Force One must first pay the government the equivalent of a first-class airline ticket. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. So, presumably, the stories they file today are more uh, heartfelt sure. than the ones they filed 30 sure. years ago. <laughs> Interesting. Well, the next compartment is the smallest one in the airplane. If you're in the press business at all, you might enjoy this picture. This is Pierre Salinger oh, as no a young kidding. man. Okay. Let me get a, let me get on that. Okay. Okay. Come on, press in here just a little bit more tightly. Wherever the president goes, he must be accompanied by the Secret Service, whether he likes it or not. Now, none have ever liked it, but none have figured out how to avoid it either. So they all put up with it as best they can. Because no one agent can be on duty around the clock, there are always several agents who accompany the president. And when he went on an aeroplane trip, the off-duty ones would occupy this compartment. They'd sit at this table, they'd read, they'd write, they play cards, they eat lunch, they drop this bunk and take a nap in it, or take a nap in this bunk, which is dropped for you to see. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to tell you that these bunks were custom designed by the Douglas Aircraft Corporation to fit the physique of an average Secret Service agent. Who fit but an in average fact, mold? Yeah, right. They are nothing more than Pullman berths liberated from old railroad cars. <laughs> The railroad companies were delighted to unload them on the government for $50 each, and the bunks fit the shape of the fuselage just fine. The brand new 747, delivered to the president last November, mm -hmm. does have custom design bunks on it that cost thousands of dollars each and probably sleep no better than these. Mm -hmm. Besides, these bunks can make a claim that no subsequent Air Force One will ever be able to make. This bunk accommodated Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> if you 
want to, you can pat it on the way by and see. That's as close as we're ever going to get. <laughs> any residual body. Every once in a while, we have a visitor who thinks so he can. Were these ever the stuck in the ice box? Like she stuck her supposedly stuck her panties in the ice box. Oh, that's she right. was that hot panties. Never mind. That's what I heard. <laughs> that's classified. That's classified. Need to know bases only. <laughs> oh. uh, so they won't see anybody. Oh, yet. look at that toaster. Well, uh, get that. Get after that. all, he was the president. He could tell them to get lost, yeah, too. <laughs> this is hot. <laughs> there we go. Oh, I get it. This is everyone's favorite compartment, the galley. Now, galley is nothing more than a word that means small kitchen. But if anybody ever called it a kitchen instead of a galley, you couldn't really take them to task because it's fully equipped. Hmm. It has a real electric oven down here. It has a three burner stove on top of it, dual sinks, hot and cold running water, a half size refrigerator underneath a 1950s hmm. countertop, hmm. and even the electricity that comes out of the wall over there and over here is not just 400 cycle standard aircraft electricity, but some of it is tapped off, run through a converter, and changed into 60 cycle standard domestic electricity, at least North American standard, mm -hmm. so that people could bring things from their homes, plug them in, and expect them to work normally. That's a real convenience, as anyone who has ever taken an American appliance to Europe and yes. try to plug it in the you hotels got it. there knows. You got it. Yeah, I heard about that. Yes. Well, there were two chefs assigned to this galley, mm. both men and both NCOs. And the tradition of all male chefs in presidential airplanes was born right here 30 years ago and has carried forward to this day. I find it very difficult to understand why there has never been a woman chef in a presidential airplane at a time when we have women pilots in the Air Force mm -hmm. and in the airlines. Mm -hmm. The more I think on that, the only plausible explanation I've been able to come up with is that perhaps they can't find a woman who wants the damn job. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, be. Yeah. well, the next compartment is the business end of the airplane, the cockpit. Have we got any pilots or navigators with us? Or okay. radio operators, flight engineers? Mm. Why don't you go up first because you'll get closest to the instrument panel that way. And everybody else follow on. Well, you'll still enjoy what you see up here. Would you like to be our navigator and take the navigator's seat? Oh, sure. This is home. Yeah. And let's take the fella in the green shirt and make him the radio operator, go. unless okay. you want to be. I think you'd no. be better if you stood in the yeah. doorway and no. used your camera. I want to be the radio operator. All right, the cushion's loose, okay. but the seat is not. All right. Well, this is a Douglas DC-6, as the airlines called it, or a C-118, as the military called it. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a paperwork distinction only. Uh, structurally, they're identical airplanes. And it is a good thing that a that's Douglas cool. was chosen for the role of presidential airplane, because back in those days, Douglas built the airliners with the largest cockpits. And that was very important because it took five crew members to fly this airplane. Mm -hmm. Two pilots and a navigator, all of whom were commissioned officers, a radio operator and a flight engineer, both of whom were non-commissioned officers, and the president was never allowed to fly around with only one flight crew. So a spare crew of five people occupied this compartment and relieved their counterparts up here on request. Yeah. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thus, whenever the president came out to the airplane, he was accompanied by ten crew members, mm -hmm. five on duty and five off duty. Back up. This place must have looked like a Chinese yeah. fire drill. <laughs> 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 well, one of those crew positions was the radio operator who sat in this seat and using all those switches, controlled this stack of radios right here, which runs ceiling to floor, weighs hundreds of pounds, costs thousands of dollars, and broke every trip because it is all vacuum tube equipment. Oh boy. Oh. Since then, 
vacuum tubes have given way to transistors mm -hmm. and transistors to integrated circuits. Yeah. So today an integrated circuit board about that big that weighs only about one pound and costs only a couple of hundred dollars can do the work that this entire stack of radios once did mm -hmm. and can do it without breaking or without tuning up. Thus a modern communications uh, radio has a control panel that doesn't look anything at all like this. Mm -hmm. It looks more like the FM receiver in mm -hmm. your car. Exactly. All you have to do is turn it on and select the channel you want to listen to or talk on. They're so simple to use that even pilots can do it. <laughs> so in a modern airplane we install those control panels up alongside each pilot mm -hmm. and we have fired the radio operator. Oh. If you were thinking about a midlife career change, this is not the place to look. I guess not. <laughs> well, similarly, the navigator sat in this seat. Let's put you right over here. The navigator sat in this seat, and using this equipment, was able to navigate across the ocean. Right. Now, you right. don't have to know much about navigation right. to appreciate the fact that this is pretty complicated equipment, mm -hmm. and so the navigator's job was pretty involved. Uh, I happen to think it was the best job in all of aviation, but then I'm prejudiced because the first 11 years of my 28-year flying career was spent navigating with equipment much like that, mm. and when it got computerized out of existence, I had to give up what I thought of as the extraordinary job of navigation and do more ordinary pilot work. But even I have to admit that a computer can navigate better than a human being. <laughs> Uh, with the possible exception of myself. <laughs> well, a modern navigation system is accessed via a keypad no more difficult to use than a touch-tone telephone. And so we have mounted those keypads up alongside each pilot right next to the radio control panel, and we have fired the navigator. So if you were thinking about a career change, again, not the place to look. Well, that leaves three seats. We'll put you back in the navigator's seat. That leaves three seats, the captain who sat in the left pilot seat, the co-pilot who sat in the right pilot seat, and the flight engineer who sat in the small seat in between them. Mm -hmm. Now the flight engineer's job was to monitor and control the engines because the engines on this airplane are piston engines and piston engines are very complicated devices needing the full-time attention of an engine technician. And that's what a flight engineer was. Today's airplanes are all jet powered and jet engines are very simple devices needing very little attention. So on a modern airplane, we not only saddle the pilots with the jobs of communications and navigation, we also make them set their own power so that we've been able to fire the flight engineer. <laughs> Well, it's dangerous working for the president, isn't it? <laughs> well, not just the president. This is true in all yeah. uh, transport yeah. category airplanes. Yeah. In 30 years, then, we have come from five crew members down to two. two. When they get it down to one, <clears throat> I start taking my bicycle. Yeah. yeah. Well, folks, that's the story of this, the last piston-powered airplane in presidential service, and the first one ever named Air Force One. Oh, no kidding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. When did it stop flying? 1965, it left presidential service and went over to the uh, Department of the Interior who used it for one year and then flew it out here to davis Monthan Air Force Base here in Tucson and put it in long-term storage where it sat for 10 years until the Air Force declared it surplus and we got it. Moved it here, uh -huh. interesting. That sure looks like an uncomfortable seat. Yes, it does. Well, the flight pad? engineer's seat is very uncomfortable. Hopefully, they chose flight engineer candidates on the basis of being physically small, because if you ever put a Bubba in that seat, hmm. he'd turn his knees to hamburger on that pedestal there. Uh. Now, modern airplanes have what is known as the option of a flight engineer station on them. Manufacturers uh, give the buyer, the first buyer, that option. But when a buyer so opts, he doesn't put a flight engineer in it. He puts a third pilot in it. Oh, okay. yeah. So you'll still hear um, airline pilots referring to the flight engineer. But in the airlines, it really means a third pilot. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, military aircraft, they do have flight engineers, even to this day. But their jobs are nowhere near as involved as the third pilot's job on an airliner. In fact, they have two or three flight engineers who do smaller things. It's not as demanding as uh, being a third pilot. Hmm. Very interesting.
Well, one last thought is, here's an example of a circuit board, a modern circuit board, that uh, takes the place of all these radios. And here's an example of a uh, circuit board navigation computer that takes the place of all this navigation equipment. That is wild. Well, we'll leave you with one last thought. If you look through the cockpit windows, you can see a yellow building up front. Mm -hmm. That building has been assembled around a B-17 flying fortress mm -hmm. that flew combat in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. If you have seen the movie Memphis Belle and liked it at all, you'll love what's inside that building because it's the real thing with all the details. Mm -hmm. uh, no Hollywoodification of it at all. By the way, the Memphis Belle flew her 25th trip in an absolutely uneventful manner. She came home with all four engines turning, with a fully uh, operational hydraulic system. The gear went down normally. Nobody was dead. Nobody was yeah. shot up. And even the weather over the target was clear. Uh -huh. So that it couldn't have been a more routine uh, mission, keeping in mind that they were talking about a combat mission. Mm -hmm. mission. Mm -hmm. Can you walk through the plane itself? You can't get in the no. airplane, but no. you can walk around it. And all around it is the uh, are displays of the equipment the that you right. actually uh, oh. had in the early 1940s, right down to the bicycles that the mechanics would buy on, uh, from the local English dealers to ride out to the airplane and then back to the uh, barracks. The line. Uh, they brought those bicycles yes. home with them, and then in the late 1940s, the United States got introduced what be to what became known as the English Racer hmm. because of them. There's one of those sitting over there. Right. So, so yeah, right. Right. Nice. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for coming, guys. Yes. Enjoy. You enjoyed it immensely. I was supposed to have a B-29. Got a B-29 sitting right I know, but I mean the pictures of the B-29. No, because that's actually not our museum. Oh. Uh, we have donated the property to the 390th squadron that flew it and, and maintained it during the war. And it is they, at least those who are left, who are created that. Yeah. But if it does, we probably agree. Want to grab that in my hat for me? Yeah. I just want to get a yeah. shot of this guy here. Uh, out of Tinian? Oh, out of Guam. Out of Guam? Saipan. okay. <laughs> I had a good friend uh, who was an aircraft commander on the WB-29 that, that preceded Enola Gay uh, over Japan that fateful day. His name was... Yeah, I just, you know, the light yeah. just takes, I uh, just fogs what, out. Now, those are like degrees on a compass? What? what? Uh, excuse me, sir. What, what would be the uh, purpose of the numbers on the window here? All right, let me see what All right, see y'all. This guy right up here. Oh, okay. Uh, this was a place where the navigator would take a device and suction cup it in there. And then when the airplane had taken off, climbed, and reached its cruise altitude and was on autopilot and cruise and nice and steady, he would be able to use that device to measure the actual heading of the airplane. Oh. And then he would compare that to the master compass, which is right here. And if the master compass didn't agree with the actual heading, he would change oh, it to agree. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are two repeater compasses, a one in front of the captain and one in front of the co-pilot. And he would look at them, too. And if they weren't reading the actual heading, nice. he would have them uh, crank in a correction. So, so that's an old form of built-in redundancy. Oh, you betcha. Now, today's compasses, uh, we, we handle it a little bit differently. When one of them goes out, it goes completely out, and a big red flag comes up and says, uh, uh, do not use, mm -hmm. or inoperative. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another device up here which is even more interesting, and that's this one. This is the periscopic sextant mount. And the navigator in those days, when he got far out over the ocean, didn't have the electronics available uh, to us today, and so he still used a, uh, a sextant which had a periscope on it. Now the periscope was a tube about oh, a foot long that had to be used in a pressurized airplane, uh, and what he did was insert that tube up here and then ram the thing home until it clicked into place. And then he would stand on top of something, typically the, uh, the box the sextant came in, and he would find a star that he recognized, Whoa. and he would shoot the angle of oh that star above the horizon. God. Then he'd swing it around, do a second star, and then swing it around, do a third star. 
and then he'd plot those three lines on his navigation chart, and where they intersected, that's where he was. Amazing. Now, most of the time they intersected in a small triangle, and he'd put a little pinpoint in that triangle and say, that's where I was. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, they'd intersect in a large triangle, huh. which meant he had made some kind of gross error, and he'd have to throw the whole thing out and do it again. Mm. That, of course, never happened to me. No, of course not. no, <laughs> not in this lifetime. Oh, look at all these up here. Huh? Look at all these controls up here. Yeah. Unbelievable. There's actually more to a modern aeroplane than this one because there's more equipment in sure. it. Sure. This is mighty impressive. Though. Fascinating, yeah. I mean, you could tell this was really state of the art. In yes, day, oh, yeah. yeah. Dynamite. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I just want to mention you're an excellent speaker. Yes. Don and I both do lectures, and we're very aware yes. of the people when they speak. And so. Yeah. You can, yeah. <laughs> you're really very professional. Yes. Nice to hear it. I thank yeah. you for the comments. Yeah. That's the reason we work here, by the way. There you go. We there can you. tell you enjoy your work. I mean, your enthusiasm yeah. when it comes. Yeah. You touch it. You live it. That's yeah. that's it. You live it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a, a real treat for us. You yeah. know, when we saw this was here, we knew we had to come on here. We were just hoping it was okay. I'm glad you did. <laughs> have a good day. Thank All right, now again. there are four buildings on the premises, and if you have the time, try to get into every one of them. This one over here has the B-17 in it. This one over here has uh, components, parts and pieces, hand plotters and uh, sextants and uh, flight suits that have Barry Goldwater's name on it and, hmm. and like that. And there's a World War II barracks over here that has a model in it of every airplane that has ever been built. There have got to be a thousand or more models. And finally, there's the main building that you came That's through that has airplanes yeah. and engines and rockets and all that sort of thing. Don't, Don't miss work. those if you can. I think we've got a work cut out for it. Thanks again. Thank now, you. One last thing. If you're photographing, you really ought to put this on top of your list. That's a, that black aeroplane over there is the SR-70. Oh, we already flight. We're intimately uh, 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 aware of that plane. Oh, yes. Alrighty. Yeah. That aeroplane holds the world's altitude record and the world's speed record yeah. for an air-breathing uh, yeah. aeroplane. Now, when was that brought here? Must have been that, recent. That got here in February. Uh -huh. and, uh, what was there, 11, 11 of them? Uh, 11 SR-71s? Well, Nine? 11 that we can account for. Yeah. Uh, okay. There were approximately two dozen built. Yeah. Uh, seven of them went to Air Force bases. One of them went here. This is the only civilian museum that has one. And three of them went to uh, NASA for high altitude research. Yeah. Now, where the other dozen or so went to is anybody's guess. But my guess is they were chopped up, melted down into titanium ingots, shipped over to Japan, and next year they're going to come back as titanium Toyotas. We find it, <laughs> we find it interesting that they are uh, using composite uh, construction that far back. Yes. It, it, so stealth technology goes back farther than the government wants to acknowledge, I think. Uh, yes, but the stealth technology came out of that. It wasn't designed in. It was an accidental occurrence. Uh -huh. The real reason that airplane is shaped like it is is because it was designed to do Mach 3, which uh -huh. it does. And the reason it's a titanium-skinned airplane is because when... Um, uh, that vehicle is going at Mach 3, it heats up to 600 degrees. Yeah. And the melting point of aluminum is 660 degrees. Interesting. So, you're, so they had to, that wasn't, that wasn't a big enough spread. You're close there so to... Uh, to titanium, whose melting point is 1800 degrees. You're flying a water balloon almost. Our fuel balloon on the yeah. leaky one. Yeah, that's what I understand, yeah. Thanks again. You betcha. Oh, See y'all. Take wonderful. care. Thanks.